And ultimately, the thing that we should fear the most is the loss of God in our lives. Not having his spirit within us, not having his leadership, his guidance, his direction, his help, his grace, his forgiveness, his pleasure. We don't want to lose God. But that means that other things have to be less, don't they? That means that the other things that we're afraid of losing have to become less and less in our lives. What I want to talk to you about today is what are the things that are going to challenge your fear of the Lord? What are the things that are going to come against you in having a fear of the Lord? Let's turn to uh, Proverbs chapter 2. Proverbs chapter 2, some verses that we read here uh, two weeks ago. Proverbs chapter 2. And notice here in verse 1, Proverbs chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding, yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. So God wants us to be seeking the knowledge that comes from him. But the knowledge that can keep us from him is the knowledge that we take from our own hearts. When we treasure our own thought and our own knowledge ahead of God, it is one of the greatest enemies we face in the fear of the Lord. That when this word is pushed aside for what we desire and think in our own heart and in our own mind. It says, to whom will the Lord look? To him who is of a poor and contrite spirit and trembles at my word. This word is so precious. This word is so holy. This word gives life and breath. There is salvation in this word. This word is what God breathed for us to understand. I mean, if you could just think of God giving you mouth-to-mouth resuscitation, what kind of life comes into you? This is breathed by God. And as it comes into our hearts, it resuscitates us. It helps us to understand a whole new way of living. And we realize, I can't live without you, God. I can't live without your wisdom, without your understanding, without your knowledge. I yearn for it. And so God blesses us with his spirit and God blesses us with his word. We can understand the very thoughts of God that he can resuscitate our life. But notice, going back to chapter one here in verse 28, notice this word, when we reject the knowledge of God, it says, then they will call on me and I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, yet they will not find me. Because they hated knowledge. Because they hated knowledge. And they did not choose the fear of the Lord. So the first enemy in our lives that comes against the fear of the Lord that we should recognize is when we choose our own way and somehow put low the knowledge of God. A man who is filled with the Spirit of God will earnestly desire to get into his word to study it out, to search it out, to understand it, because he wants to understand the heart and mind of God. And so it is a natural process that if we fear God, if we truly believe in him, then this word, we will tremble before. We will tremble before his word. We want to understand it. And this becomes the most important things in our life. So then when we have choices in our day-to-day living, and we have a choice between following the word of God or what we think is right, what do we fear most? What do we rely on most? What is the thing that should be pushing in our life? It comes back to God's word. So that is why man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, because that is how we know which way to go. And our fear of the Lord will bring us to God's word to understand it and to seek it out. And by doing so, we will understand the fear of the Lord. 
Next, let's turn over to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus is telling us what is to come. And he's telling us what, some expectations that we should have as the children of God and the way that things will be as we are followers of his. Notice here in verse 17, it says, Beware of men. Beware of men. Be aware of them. What are we to be aware of? For they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. And when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father who speaks in you. Now brother will deliver up brother to death, a father his child. Children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you shall be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. When they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For surely I say to you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master, it is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of his household? Therefore, do not fear them, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will be not, uh, not be made known. Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak it in the light. Whatever you hear in the ear, preach on the house tops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hellfire. Fear him who destroys both body and soul. So this is where the fear of the Lord becomes so powerful in our lives because we can fear what man can do to us, how they can hurt us, how they can speak ill of us, and how they can put us down, and how they can take our lives. So notice Jesus says, be aware of it, but he's not saying be afraid of it. He's saying, no, this is going to happen, but don't let it affect your conduct before God. Now, friends, it is the loss of reputation, it is the loss of life that is so common in our society today, where things can be done because of loss of life. How will we be? But in this society, we do not see so much what happens around the world in the martyrs that go on and those who are in prison who are being delivered up at this time, who are in jail for their belief in the following of Jesus Christ, whose lives are being taken. And these verses are saying, when somebody is threatening your physical life, do not fear them over the one who can take not only your physical life, but also can destroy your soul. It is God who has immortality, and it, imm immortality is in him alone. And he is the one that grants life. You see, when we look at the big powers of God versus the powers of man, what can they do in comparison? The best and the worst is that they can take your physical life. Ultimately, it's death that has held man in bondage all his lifetime, it says in Hebrews. It is the fear of death. But once you embrace death and you say, I have died with Jesus Christ, and you believe that, not just saying it, but walking in a faith saying, whatever moment I have is for you, God. If I die today, these moments till that time is for you because my hope is an eternal life that Jesus will give me at his return then what fear do I have when someone says, you will lose your life? We can think of so many accounts, but Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they had a choice. And they said, even if it costs us our life, we will not bow down to that idol, to that image. Man's pressure, Jesus said, be aware of it. Be aware of what men will do 
because they will put pressure on you to not obey God. Let's, with that in mind, let's turn over and look in 1 Samuel. We'll add on a point very similar to this. Notice here in 1 Samuel chapter 8, or excuse me, 1 Samuel chapter 15. First Samuel chapter 15 is the story of Saul being given a mission by God to go forward to destroy the Amalekites. So as we've considered, there are things in our own hearts, our own desires for our knowledge and our way versus God's. That can be an enemy of the fear of the Lord. Another enemy of the fear of the Lord is when somebody threatens your physical life. This enemy is when we fear what people want and we choose obedience to them over God. Notice here in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 2, it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel and how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them but kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. It's quite a command, isn't it? It's quite a command that, that the Lord had given through Samuel of what to do. So as the story goes, we won't read it. You can read it later on your own, 1 Samuel 15. But as it goes on, as the story declares, here we come to a time where we see that Saul did not do what he was told. Samuel shows up and he hears cattle. He hears the bleeding of sheep. He says, what is this? What have you done? And of course the king is still there and alive. And it says here in verse 18, now the Lord sent you, this is Samuel speaking to Saul, sent you on a mission and said, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? Why didn't you do what he said? And Saul said to Samuel, But I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and I went on the mission on which the Lord sent me and brought back Agag, king of Amalek, and I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the plunder, sheep and oxen, the best of things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. But the people. One of the things that is lacking so much in this world is leadership for the Lord. Leadership for the Lord. Leadership for the Lord is about the heart of a servant who so is committed to the will of his master that that is what dictates the very conduct and behavior and speech in that person's life. Leadership to the Lord is about being humble before God and to look for the instruction that comes from him and when it comes, to be convicted and be committed to carrying out that word. See, as we come to the word of God, we should be like the man who comes trembling saying, what is your word? And when it is spoken to say, I will do it. God grant me the strength and power of your will that I may do the very things that you've commanded me to do and that I would do them with conviction to you and that my heart wouldn't get in the way and that threats wouldn't get in the way and that what the people want wouldn't get in the way of my obedience to you. There is a heart that God wants us to have that is so convicted and so committed to him that it does not matter what other people want when we are carrying out his will and his commission. That's the heart of loyalty. That is the walk of faith that Eddie was talking about in, the, in our time of prayer. It's God in our worship that we stand on the rock and we believe in him and following him is the dictate of our life. The fear of the Lord 
That's why in Revelation, when the angel goes forward with the eternal gospel, the first thing is fear God and give him glory. Give God the glory. So here, God has given this mission, and notice what Samuel says, because friends, this is written for you and me. He says, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offering and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? What does he want? What is God looking for? Behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice, to heed than the fat of rams. Remember when we went through not that long ago the story of how David was moving the ark, how they were singing, how they were praising, they were calling on the name of God, they were loving God, and then somebody disobeyed God and they died. All the singing, all the praising, all the calling on God didn't prevent the word of God from coming forth and God's judgment from coming forth when they disobeyed his word to them. So what did they do? They went back to God. They were repenting. They were sorrowful. God, what happened? And it says that they went back and they read the word of God about how to move that ark. And then they moved it. And then they called on the name of the Lord. And then they sang. And then they sacrificed. And then they praised. And the ark moved beautifully. You see, in our lives, it's so easy to think that it gets caught up in what we think we should be doing unto God. But when God has spoken, we must submit to his will and word first. And submit to him. So notice what he says here then, and again in verse 22, Behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice, to heed than the fat of rams. But rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Now friends, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, and we started talking about this subject of the fear of the Lord, that should be our Fear, to not have a relationship with God, to not be led by God according to his purpose and his plan for our lives. That should be what scares us the most. Notice what Saul said. I have sinned, I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Public opinion, what other people want, what other people think you should do. Friends, this is happening to us all the time. We are called upon to compromise because of public opinion. We are called upon to think differently because of what people say. And in this world, it will continue to go on and on and on. I remember when God started to work with me as, as a young man and, and, as, and, and the revelation that I needed to obey God's commandments. It was such an amazing revelation. Now, it wasn't that my parents didn't teach me to obey God's commandments because they did. But there was one big commandment that wasn't being followed at all, even though I had it memorized from, a, from my youth, and that was to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It is interesting the number of times in my life that I have been challenged to not keep that commandment. To say that you don't need to keep the commandments of God. To say that that commandment has been done away. That things have changed, that the day was changed, that things were changed. There's always many reasons about why not to do it. But what's so amazing about all the reasons that I've heard, not one of them comes back to the word of God to say, God says, it's no longer holy. Do not keep it. Reject it. Let it go. Now what's interesting is, as a young man and growing up, I would have people challenge my faith and say, you don't need to do that anymore. In fact, by doing it, you're rejecting God. Now that's a very interesting point. To say that obedience to God would be rejecting God is a very interesting point because the only way we know what God is telling us to do is by listening to him either by what we see in his word or by the spirit. So we have a choice then, don't we? To fear what God speaks or to fear what man says. 
Now, many times, even since starting this church, I've been asked the question, do you think that breaking the Sabbath is a sin? Do you know why that question gets asked? It's because we can look and see people who call on the name of the Lord who do not keep the Sabbath. So the fear is, to be correct, I should say, no, it's not a sin. Would that be the truth? The truth is, it is a sin to break the commandment of God. The truth is, it is a sin to not keep the Sabbath day holy. So says your Bible. Every one of us can read what it says. There's no disputing. God is not clouded in what he says. I don't have to judge anyone. Praise the Lord. I don't have to judge anybody's conduct. That authority has been given to the Lord Jesus Christ, and it is his to make the judgments. I don't have to judge any person on who they are, where they stand. In fact, Paul, the Apostle Paul said, I don't even judge myself. I commit my judgment to the Lord, to whom I look like you look, and the Apostle Paul looked, and say, have mercy on me, I'm a sinner. But I will not pretend to say that it is not a sin, because the Bible says it is. We should not change the word of God to comply with an idea or a thought of the world. Rather, the world should comply with the word of God, and we should submit our beliefs and what we teach as a standard to him. That is where the beginning of knowledge is. That is where the beginning of wisdom is. That is where understanding the way of God is when we fear God first before the ideas of mankind. So we cannot say something that opposes the word or otherwise what will happen to our practice and our doctrine? It'll go astray. It'll go astray. And what is a very interesting thing is that, as we read, when someone doesn't seek the knowledge of God, what happens? Their hearts go astray. It is revelation that there is not a fear of God. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 2. Notice this in Jeremiah chapter 2. In verse 19. Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 19. It says, Your wickedness will correct you, and your backsliding will rebuke you. Know therefore and see that it is an evil and bitter thing that you have forsaken the Lord your God, and the fear of me is not in you, says the Lord God of hosts. So when we see that our lives are not in line with what the word of God says, we must acknowledge then we're not fearing God first. Saul saw when Samuel came to him that he did not obey the word of God. He feared the people. Friends, the heart that God wants us to have is loyal and obedient to him first. That's the first great commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. This is the great commandment to fear God and to give him glory, to give him first place in our lives, that his word, that his life, that his spirit would dictate to us the way that we live and that we would not be given into man. I assure you, if you can look at this now in your life, you'll see so many ways this is being challenged in you day by day. There are so many ways it's being challenged because it's not just something like, the Sabbath commandment. It can be commandments regarding murder, abortion. It can be things such as fornication, sexual immorality, adulteries, covetousness, lying, cheating, idolatry, and on and on it goes. All these things to challenge us in our hearts who do we fear? Who do we fear? Is it man? Or is it God? So who is it that we seek to please? Turn over with me to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Now 
Notice here with me in verse 22. Colossians 3, verse 22. It says in Colossians 3.22, Bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. I want you to notice the contrast that he makes in this verse because it's very clear. He says, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service, right, So that's the image that you can put on. It's contrasted with sincerity of heart. Sincerity of heart is not just about doing it for a show. It's doing it because you know it's the right thing to do. And he says, it makes the contrast, not as eye service, as men pleasers, rather fearing God as a God pleaser. Now this is where the fear of God can change our lives so deeply because it is not dependent on what anybody else sees. It's dependent on you believing that God sees and that he knows what's going on in your very heart. See, here's where faith really comes in. The faith that we know that God exists and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. It is the place that takes us from just going through motions and doing what is right in the eyes of people, maybe for their accolades, maybe for their worship. Where we say, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in pleasing him. And fearing him, he dictates what I do when nobody's around. And whether people are around or not, it doesn't matter because what I'm doing is in a sincerity of heart to God And my conduct is guided by a fear of him realizing that who he is is more powerful and more righteous and more good and more kind and more merciful than anything this world can offer. You see, when the world brings its fears, it usually comes with intimidation, right? It comes with political correctness. It's the power of the majority to have tyranny. And sometimes the majority today in media is a minority that shouts so loud that it makes you feel like you want to shut up. That you want to say, well, I don't want to cause any ripples. That I don't want to speak the truth. That I don't want to be plain. What would they think of me? Oh, if we only had a fear of the Lord like we had a fear of people this country would be turned upside down. A fear of people, what will they think of me? We should be asking, what will you think of me, God? What do you think? What is it that pleases you? How can I walk in your ways? You see, in the flesh, the world has can come up with a way to not be men pleasers by basically saying, whatever, forget you. And they say it in a lot more mean ways than that. I'm just, I'm going with the, with the sermon uh, versions. People, will, uh, people will, will, will say things to people to not be men pleasers, right? But it comes from a carnal spirit that is not loving. It's basically a, well, I won't say it, but the, the attitude is, I don't care about you or anything that's going on with you. I'm my own person. If you don't like it, tough, be gone with you. And that's kind of the attitude that comes out in a worldly person. And that's not what we're talking about here today. The fear of God is something that is steady and sound and actually produces tremendous peace. The fear in the world produces anxiety. The fear of the Lord produces peace. Because behind the power of God is everything good and righteous and just and faithful and reliable. He is so good that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. This is the God who is the power of the universe and he's filled with humility He's long-suffering, he's generous, he's kind. So the God we fear 
is saying, you're the great power of the universe. Everything in my life needs to realize who you are and how insignificant I am. Everything that I want or have is based on you. Why wouldn't I fear you? You're the only one that can take away from me what I desire. You can destroy my soul. You can take away the pleasure of you, God. That when we seek him and fear the loss of him in our lives, and that that would be the thing that motivates, that that would be the thing that turns away and says, what are, what are these other things? What comparison do they hold? God wants to see what's going on between you and him. Between me and him. Do we treasure that relationship more than anything? See, when we fear him, as I was saying, we fear a God that produces peace and tranquility. The world's fears produce anxiety, doubt, trepidation. They tear away confidence, courage. They'll tear away even at justice and righteousness. They'll make us do things to survive. To save our own life. But Jesus said, he who seeks to save his life shall lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake shall find it. So the fear of the Lord produces peace in those who know him and those who love him. And what's so great is you don't need to worry about pleasing man if you're pleasing God because when you please God and know the fear of the Lord in your heart, then those who love God will see it and be glad. And those who don't will be against you. So when the godly see the godly, what do they do? They rejoice. They rejoice. So who are you trying to please? That is the question. Who is first in your life that you want to please? Is it God Almighty? Now turn with me back to Deuteronomy chapter 13. I'm going to shift gears here a little bit about another enemy of fearing the Lord. Another enemy of fearing the Lord. Deuteronomy chapter 13. Notice what it says here. Deuteronomy 13. It says, If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes to pass, of which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. In other words, the fear of God comes first. Obedience to God comes first. So this is kind of an interesting thing that God says, isn't it? Because what did God say he did it for? He, it's a test. To test what? Whether you fear the Lord, whether you'll walk in his ways, whether you will follow his voice and obey him. Who do we tremble before? So one of the things that's so amazing when we look at the prophecies of the end time, what are we told will happen? There will be false prophets, yes? Seducing spirits, right? Deceivers, liars, who work what? Signs and wonders. Now, if signs and wonders are the identifying sign of who's of God, well, you're going to go after many different ways. But God in his own law and in the word of the New Testament, both by the words of Jesus and by the Apostle Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2 says... Those who work these lying signs, they're going to come and they're going to tell you a lawless way. 
they're going to lead you in a path of lawlessness. They're going to put down the word of God. They're going to put down the following of God. They're going to put down obedience to God in championing signs and wonders. I want you to notice here in chapter 13 here of Deuteronomy, he says, and if the signs or wonders come to pass, Jesus said there's going to be false Christs. There's going to be false apostles. So if someone comes along and works miracles and says, I come as an apostle sent by God, working miracles, signs and wonders that you can see, and they're saying, you don't need to obey God anymore in his commandments. Just know the power. What do you say? Do you find it questioning in your own heart? Are those the things that identify? Because what we've been told, we've been assured of, is that it will happen. So what made Christ's miracles so awesome was that they came with the word of God. They didn't come with another spirit in another way. They came with the word of God, and they were supporting that. But if there is a sign and it's not supported by the word of God, then we must reject it and let it go. It needs to not have a standing in our lives. Now, this is very powerful, because when you read 2 Thessalonians 2, there's a lot talked about the, the spirit of lawlessness that comes about with lying signs and miracles and wonders. And even the Lord Jesus, in his Sermon on the Mount, in speaking, said, there will be many that will say, Lord, Lord, in that day, because they saw the signs and were doing those. But he said, but were you doing my will? He said, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. The way they thought they were Christians was because they were casting out demons and doing signs and wonders. They were prophesying. That's not the sign. The sign is, do you do the will of God as revealed in his word? That's the heart. And every sign and wonder should lead us to following the word. If the signs and wonders are leading us away from the word, run. Run. If the signs and wonders are saying, you don't need to study God's word, run. Because that's not the spirit. The spirit of God works signs and wonders to confirm the word, not to take away from the word. So always remember that. So in our seeking of signs, in our seeking of wonders, in our seeking of the gifts of the spirit, they must always be going back to the litmus test. As it says in Isaiah 20, to the law and to the prophets... If they speak not according to these words, it is because there is no light in them. Remember that. It's a warning that God gives us, but it is one of the things that can take us away from a fear of the Lord to be amazed or impressed by signs. What we should be impressed by is this word and then the signs and wonders we rejoice in because those that signs and wonders from God, the miracles, confirm the word. They don't detract from it. All right, let's turn over now to Joshua chapter 24. We'll finish up here. Joshua chapter 24. Joshua is coming toward the end of this ministry that he had and as he's talking with the people, there was, there was much still going on at that time and, and the work that needed to still be done for the people to inherit the promises. And obviously as we read on in Judges, it didn't go so well. People started doing every man what was right in his own eyes. I think, Scott, you talked about that last week. Every man doing what was right in his own eyes. That is not the way to go. But in order to do that, we must do the things that Joshua says here to us. In Joshua chapter 24, Joshua chapter 24, notice what it says here. Now therefore, fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve Yahweh. 
Now, if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord, Yahweh, the true. So the people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God is he who brought us and our fathers up out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way and we went, uh, that we went in among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out from before us all the people, including the Amorites who dwell in the land. We also will serve Yahweh, for he is our God. But Joshua said to the people, you cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God, he is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after he has done you good. And the people said to Joshua, no, but we will serve the Lord. So Joshua said to the people, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord, Yahweh, for yourselves to serve him. And they said, we are witnesses. Now therefore, he said, put away the foreign gods which are among you and incline your heart to the Lord God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, the Lord Yahweh our God, we will serve in his voice, we will obey. This last point, one of the biggest enemies to us fearing the Lord is when we serve other gods. Now, what's so interesting is even as Joshua's talking about this, he talks about the gods of the Amorites, the gods of the Egyptians, the gods that you can find in any nation of the world, in any walk of life. There are so many gods in this world. And how do you know if you have a god in your life? That god is dictating to you for your time and your worship, your devotion, your adoration, Now, this isn't saying that we aren't to enjoy things. God says that he gives gifts to people and he gives gifts to man. In fact, he says God gives you the fruit of your labors that you can enjoy them. This is a gift from God, it says in Ecclesiastes. But is our life being dictated to by anything that we are giving it more homage than God? Because something that is, we read there in Joshua that will destroy our relationship with God, even after he has done us good, is when we put other gods first, before him. So if our lives are so filled up that we cannot devote ourselves to prayer, to fasting, to the study of his word, to listening to his voice, to seeking his face, can we just stop for a moment and say, there are other gods in my life? Can we acknowledge that here today? That those things are getting in a way of the fear of the Lord in my life. See, if we don't have time to read God's word, what are we filling our life with? There must be something that's taking his place. If we don't have time to seek his face, to fast and to pray, why not? Are we fearing not having the life that we have carved out for ourselves and the loss of that so much that we have pushed God out and brought other things in that are maybe more enjoyable to us, that we think are more satisfying, that maybe we believe, wrongfully so, that provide us the comfort that we need in our lives. You see, this is where you really contest what your God is. What do you turn to in your time of need? What do you need to have when things aren't going well? What do you turn to when things are going great? What do you worship? What do you adore? What do you pay homage to? What will you lay down your money and your time for? You see, that is a really good way to look at where your gods are. Because if you say, man, I'm so busy, I just haven't had time to pray, I say that in myself some days. I go through a day and I'm like, man, I just haven't had the time. Shame on me. Shame on me. 
And I have to come back to the Lord and I have to repent because what has happened? I have been giving myself in devotion to other gods all day long and they have been ruling me and not him first. That's wrong. How many masters do you have? No man can have two masters. He will either love the one and hate the other or hate the one and love the other. You cannot serve both God and the things of this world. If your life doesn't demonstrate a commitment to the fear of the Lord in the sense that we stop, drop, and look up to the creator of the universe and give him glory, the rest of the day is an absolute waste. You realize if we're not going through the day in the spirit of the fear of the Lord and the worship of God, what are we doing? And if you find yourself in a place saying, that kind of looks like my life, be afraid. Be terrified because it is so deceitful to get consumed with the busyness of this world. If your life is filled up with stuff and you yourself are empty of God in everything that you're doing, you should stop and be afraid and know the fear of the Lord. How deceived I have been to be chasing so many masters, to be giving my life to so many things. Where is God? Because if God is not in our life, friends, everything else is loss. The beauty comes when God is first. When God is first, you know what? Your job has purpose. When you go to work has purpose. When you drive has purpose. When you go to the store has purpose because the fear of the Lord is in your heart and you're being guided by the directions of the Lord. It may look like somebody's life who doesn't look to God at all. It may look so much the same. But it's not. Because you're doing it before the Lord as opposed to just doing it for yourself. And the reality is that when we give ourselves to God first, he can say what happens. He can dictate a whole different day for you. You might think you're doing this, but he wants you to do this. The fear of the Lord is to say, I am not my own. The fear of the Lord is to say, my heart is for you, almighty God. How am I going to live in obedience to you? So I ask you to think about these points. We talked about what comes against the fear of God in our lives. What is it that comes against? One, when we choose what we want, our own ways. When we choose what we want. Two, when we fear man and the threats for our life more than we fear God who can destroy both body and soul. Three, it's the things that we're trying to obey people in and please them ahead of pleasing God. That we don't want to hurt them or make them think ill of us so we go along with what they want rather than being true to the word of God. We become men pleasers as opposed to God pleasers. Four, when things amaze us and try to allure us away from God's word. When they try to get us to go in a different path because of amazing signs and wonders. And five, it's other gods. The gods that we pursue in our lives, the gods that we think will provide us some kind of deliverance or salvation or comfort, and they take the role of God in our lives because we think that is what we're working toward when where our time and our life should be is in redeeming it unto Almighty God. That is the fear of God. Now, if you find yourself today under any conviction of sin, of any conviction of righteousness, if you can say, 
I'm not sure I have been fearing the Lord because really my life is being dictated to by other things. I would ask that you would allow us to minister to you today, whether up front or in the back or wherever, but seek someone out who can pray. There's always people up here that can pray after. But I would ask you to bring it to the Lord, to let it out. So find somebody you trust. It might be the person sitting right next to you, right now, that you should just say, you know, I find myself convicted. Will you pray for me here? This is a house of prayer. This is a house that we want sincerity of heart. This is a house where we want dedication to the Lord that with all that we do may be giving glory and honor to you, Holy Father. Because everything else is just a charade. And that's not what we're interested in. We're interested in a relationship with God. And his word has shown us we should fear him first. So if there's anything you need help with, prayer for, it says to confess to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. And so do that with a loved one that you trust. Do that with someone. Or if so, you choose, go to the Lord. But don't just let this sermon fall down to the ground in your life. Let the words that we read from the scripture take hold and bring about conviction and revival where needed. Tear down the high places and let the spirit of the Lord fill your life and your heart. May the Lord bless you. Thank you, David. David, do you know what song we're going to sing right now? (laughs) You don't have any idea, do you? (laughs) You ended in Joshua 24. And uh, we are going to sing, As for me and my house, we will serve you. (laughs) Thank you, Father. Thank you for leading Thank you for leading us. So this song is called Today, and it's a, it's a declaration of our decision to follow you, God, to give our yes to you, to hear your voice and live, to follow you. So what a perfect ending to the, to the sermon. So let's, uh, let's stand. And I am having a senior moment as a non-senior. Um, yes, it's Bill Rizek. I asked you to give the closing prayer, and I could not remember for about eight seconds. So, Bill, you're going to give the closing prayer, which I did ask you before church, but I just now remembered. Okay, good. Your wife does it all the time. Um, all right, so let's sing today. <laughs>